Good morning, and welcome to worship this morning. Uh, oops, booming. Uh, it's good to see you again, and uh, it's it's been good for us. We've we've enjoyed a wonderful mixture of meeting old friends, of holiday, of golf. Got my first hole in one this week. Uh, Fifty-seven years of playing this game. And finally, Bermuda was good to me. <laughs> so um, we can't wait to come back again. You know, <laughs> uh, I need to persuade Alistair to go on longer holidays. So uh, it's lovely to be with you again this morning. Can I draw your attention uh, to the notices? And perhaps in particular, just to remind you of the diversity uh, supper or dinner, which will be uh, on Saturday evening, Alistair will be back just about um, in time for the supper, and he'll be taking the services next Sunday. Um, also, just a reminder that um, last Wednesday evening, uh, I, I gave a, a talk about um, the Church of Scotland's involvement in world mission across the world, and I did bring with me a few of these um, reports from the World Mission Council on uh, our living together with other world religions. And there's just a few of them in the fellowship hall, if anybody's particularly interested in reading uh, this just newly published report. And if you get a chance to read it, maybe pass it on to somebody else who is also interested in reading it. And I hope you got, each got a bookmark um, this morning as you come into church. If you didn't get one on the way out, these are world mission um, reminders. Also, this Wednesday evening, I plan to give another talk in the hall, this time on the, the life and times of the honeybee uh, and some of the lessons we have to learn from the, the way they live, uh, the way they colonize, and some of the lessons that we learn from references in the Bible to bees and to honey, uh, not least the reference to the, the land flowing with milk and honey. And we'll be talking something, uh, we'll be talking a little bit about that land flowing with milk and honey this morning uh, in a reflection in the sermon. So that's at 7.30 on Wednesday. Um, the rest of the notices are as printed. Our call to worship is printed in the order of service. God has given us breath to live and spirit to sing. God has gathered us into a community of care and worship. The hymn 44, Praise Waits for Thee in Zion, Lord.
Today we remember how Jesus, the risen Lord, was made known to his friends in the breaking of bread, and how their hearts were set ablaze as they talked with him on the road. May he be made known to us in the breaking, in the breaking of the day, in the breaking of hearts, and in the breaking of bread. Let us pray. O hidden source of life, we meet now to meditate upon the great and gracious plan which you have brought to pass, that women and men like us should look beyond creation to, wor to worship you, the creator of all things. In the beginning, you, the uncreated, moved across the face of the deep and brought out space and time, and then material substance, the atom and the molecule, and the crystalline form, then the first germ of life and the long upward striving of all things that swim and creep and fly, and then the miracle of intelligence and consciousness, and the beginning of mystery and the building of the first altar, and then the saying of the first prayer. O oh, hidden love of God, forgive us for those times when we have taken this mystery for granted, and forgive us all the more for the times when we have thought that we had unraveled the mystery and thought that we knew it all, the how, the where, and the why. Almighty God, let us not harbor anything in our hearts that might spoil our fellowship with you or with one another. Work within us and work with us. Do what you will with us. Make us what you want of us. Change us as we need to be changed and use us as your will requires through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Are the children prepared to come out and have a wee moment with me this morning? <clears throat> Hi again. Good to see you all. Remember last week I, I told you about the Church of Scotland Tartan, that, um, all that checked uh, material with all the different colours in it that represent different parts of, of our faith and different parts of, of Scotland indeed. Well, I've left some samples of the tartan in the fellowship hall as well, and if anyone would like to order any of the bits and pieces that there are, they put your name on the list and I'll get Alistair to, to bring them back with him on this, hopefully, his homeward journey at the end of this week. But this week, I want to talk to you about something else altogether. This, I found this in the garage at the man's. Yes, it's a stick. But supposing, supposing you were in a race and you were the first person holding this stick and you were running up to somebody else to whom you were going to pass this stick, what would it be called? It would be called a real ale race. And what would the stick be called? It's the baton. Would someone like to take the baton? Right, if you stand here, right, okay. Would you like to be next in the race? So you, right. So you're going to start. And would you like to be next in the race? Okay. So it's a relay race now. You're going to pass the baton. Run up there and pass the baton into your hand. And you run and pass it up there. And you run to the end. <laughs> and guess what? You're the winner. Hey. And what they did there was pass the baton on to each other. And we do that in re relay races. And if you finish without the baton, you could be as far ahead as you like, but you haven't won the race. The way in which, the way in which our faith, what we believe, the way in which it's passed on 
from person to person. The way in which it's passed on from generation to generation is like the passing on of a baton. So what your mom and dad believed, then you might come to believe. Or what one generation in a church believes tries to pass that on to others, others of the same generation and others of another generation. But the baton, thank you very much, the baton isn't an old stick found in the man's garden. The real baton of the Christian church is the communion cup and the plate. Now, the other real baton of the Christian church is the, the font where we christen our babies or sometimes where our adults are baptized. And it's through the sacraments, through baptism and through the bread and wine of communion that we receive the faith and we pass it on. Ever since Jesus took the first cup and the first plate and the first bread and shared it with his disciples on the night before he was tried and put to death, we have passed on that tradition. And it's like the baton of the faith. People will think that all sorts of, there are all sorts of ways in which faith is passed on. But one of the most important throughout 2,000 years now has been the sacrament of Holy Communion, and the sacrament of baptism, the way in which we pass the faith on from generation to generation. This communion cup and this plate, I bought these in the town of Hebron in the Holy Land just a wee while ago. I'm going to refer to, I'm going to use them in communion this morning, and I'm going to refer to them in my sermon. But they're very special to me because Hebron is one of these Oh, it's a complicated town. It's a divided town. And uh, we all pray that one day there will be peace across the world. And there won't be peace across the world until there's peace in places like Hebron. And I just hope that this, I bought this from an Arab trader. And, and he wasn't, it wasn't even a Christian Arab, but he was selling communion plates. And one day I hope that place that's Hebron and all sorts of places like it across the world will live in peace. And for me, these are a symbol of peace and love and a symbol of the passing on of our faith. I'm going to say more about that to the adults. But thank you for helping me to show you how the faith is passed on. Now we're going to sing, The Church is Wherever God's People Are Praising knowing they're wanted and loved by their Lord. Want to take one of these? There you are. Take one, pass it on. Take one, pass them on. Take one, and pass them on. It's hymn 522.
now may God go with these our children, that they may learn to love him through Christ our Lord. Amen. Thank you. Thank you. Now hear the word of God. Hear the word of God proclaimed in the uh, book of Psalms. The reading is uh, Psalm 118, your, uh, verses 1 to verse 2 and 19 to 29. You'll find this on page 565 in the um, Bibles in your pew. 118, a song of victory. O oh, give thanks to the Lord, for he is good. His steadfast love endures forever. Let Israel say, his steadfast love endures forever. Open to me the gates of righteousness, that I may enter through them and give thanks to the Lord. This is the gate of the Lord, the righteous shall enter through it. And I thank you that you have answered me and have become my salvation. The stone that the builders rejected has become the chief cornerstone. This is the Lord's doing, it is marvelous in our eyes. This is the day that the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. Save us, we beseech you, O Lord. O Lord, we beseech you, give us success. Blessed is the one who comes in the name of the Lord. We bless you from the house of the Lord. The Lord is God. And he has given us light. Bind the festal, festal procession with branches up to the horns of the altar. You are my God, and I will give you thanks to you. You are my God, I will extol you. O oh, give thanks to the Lord, for he is good, for his steadfast love endures forever. Now the choir will lead us in the anthem, Come Let Us Join, by Isaac Watts.
Our Gospel lesson this morning is to be found in the Gospel according to St. Luke in chapter 19, reading from verse 28, page 83 of the New Testament section of the Pew Bible. St. Luke 19 at verse 28, the triumphal entry into Jerusalem. After he had said this, he went on ahead going up to Jerusalem. When he had come near Bethphage and Bethany at the place called the Mount of Olives, he sent two of his disciples saying, go into the village ahead of you and as you enter it you will find tied there a coat that has never been ridden. Untie it and bring it here. If anyone asks you, why are you untying it? Just say this, the Lord needs it. So those who were sent departed and found it as he had told them. As they were untying the colt, its owners asked them, Why are you untying the colt? They said, The Lord needs it. Then they brought it to Jesus, and after throwing their cloaks on the colt, they set Jesus on it. As he rode along, people kept spreading their cloaks on the road. As he was now approaching the path down from the Mount of Olives, the whole multitude of the disciples began to praise God joyfully with a loud voice for all the deeds of power that they had seen, saying, Blessed is the King who comes in the name of the Lord. Peace in heaven and glory in the highest heaven. Some of the Pharisees in the crowd said to them, Teacher, order your disciples to stop. He answered, I tell you, if these were silent, the stones would shout out. Amen and thanks be to God for this reading from his most holy word. To his name be the praise and the glory. The hymn 461, How Sweet the Name of Jesus Sounds in a Believer's Ear. of my mouth and the meditations of all our hearts be acceptable in thy sight, O Lord, our strength and our Redeemer. Amen. Unusually this morning the readings were the readings for 
Palm Sunday. And that's because this morning I want to begin by telling you about my experience of being in Jerusalem earlier this year on Palm Sunday. We gathered thousands of Christians on the top of the Mount of Olives with thousands of other Christians so that we could descend into the Kidron Valley and then ascend up into the old city of Jerusalem, tracing the footsteps of Jesus on the first Palm Sunday. It was fiercely hot. There's a picture on the front of the order of service this morning that I took looking back up the hill towards the Mount of Olives, thousands of us. The throng was as multinational as you could ever imagine. Christians from all over the world flying the flags of their nation. Messianic Jews, Hebrew speaking and English speaking. Every conceivable denomination of this tapestry of peculiar people who self-identify as Christian. Ethnic Christian, Evangelical Christian, Catholic, Orthodox, Anglican, Baptist, Lutheran, Presbyterian, Liberal, and Conservative. There they all were, more denominations than I ever imagined there were. Together we were all singing Hosanna, flying our flags, and celebrating the start of the holiest week of the Christian year in the holiest city on earth. Except it isn't holy. Under the surface of this show of Christian strength and solidarity, there is a festering sore. Jerusalem is amongst the most contested territory on earth. During its long history, Jerusalem has been destroyed twice, besieged 23 times, attacked 52 times, and captured and recaptured 44 times. It has been occupied by, to name but a few, the Babylonians, the Persians, the Greeks. In Jesus' time, occupied by the Romans. In recent time, occupied by the Ottomans. And it has been subject to a British mandate as well. No place on earth carries more scars of identity in its DNA than the city of Jerusalem. It has been the subject of so many crusades so many battles, and so many atrocities. Our journey began in East Jerusalem, an area which, in living memory, at the time of the, the establishment of the State of Israel, it was occupied by Jordan. But then, in the Six-Day War, in 1967, it was snatched by the Israeli offensive and the occupier of this part of Jerusalem and of other areas in the West Bank became occupied by the Israeli state, occupying land which by international law and definition belongs to another people. On Palm Sunday, on the surface and visible to all, was the presence of heavily armed priests, police and military as the latest in a long line of occupiers exercised their control over the city. Before the end of the day, arrests were made. If I had wanted to, I could have flown my Scottish flag to indicate that Scotland was there in the Palm Sunday Parade. But those who flew the Palestinian flag 
were singled out. They had been banned from flagging up their presence, and their flags were confiscated along the route, and some of the flag bearers were detained. Sadly, at the heart of the Israeli-Palestinian dispute, there is more than just an argument about land and borders. It is, in fact, deeper than that. It is a refusal on either side to recognize the legitimate identity of the other. This is the deepest of sins, to suggest that the other, whoever they are, of whatever race or kind, to suggest that the other has no right to exist. I never thought I would ever join a Palm Sunday procession, which was controlled by a military presence. And I never thought I would ever be a part of a Palm Sunday celebration which ended up in the arrest of some of my fellow pilgrims. But that just shows, perhaps, how naive I am. And it just demonstrates how little we all know about the pain and the struggle of others when it comes to expressing their identity, never mind their faith, or being granted their human rights, never mind their dignity, or being recognized for their humanity, never mind their nationality. But am I that stupid? The first Palm Sunday was not just an exaltation of Jesus as the Prince of Peace. The first Palm Sunday was a red rag to the bull of the authorities of both city and temple. The first Palm Sunday was a declaration of challenge to those who would, on the one hand, use religion to control and to contain the children of God, and on the other hand, it was a judgment on the Roman occupier, which was denying ordinary people their right to freedom. And before the end of that first Holy Week, a young man was arrested for overturning the temple tables and for undermining the civic authorities. As we descended from the Mount of Olives, we paused at one of the most authentic sites in the Holy Land. If you ever get the chance to travel or if you have, have done so, you will know that very often people try to pass off sites as the original ones, but really we don't know if they, if they were. But one of the most authentic sites in the Holy Land is the Garden of Gethsemane where in the first century, all the competing forces of the most fought-over city in history came together. Faithful disciples with a fragile faith, they were there. A betrayer with who knows what motive was there. A detachment of soldiers was there. The guardians of the ancient faith were there lurking in the background waiting for the betrayer to point out the one who was to be betrayed. Simon Peter was there, with sword in hand, ready to use it, and did. The Son of Man was there, telling him to put away his sword, and resigned to drinking the cup that God had given him. He, most importantly of all, was there. All of the conflicting forces that once conspired to have Jesus arrested and tried and put to death are all of them still in the land in which he walked and talked and prayed. Such a melting pot. 
But it's also true that such forces are prevalent in almost every seat of power across the world. From Hamilton across the Bay to Washington across the Atlantic, from London to Moscow, from Juba to Pyongyang. But strange as it may seem, I want to suggest to you that this extraordinary mixture of peoples, of emotions, of beliefs, and of cultures, and this extraordinary mix of violence and benign resistance is the stuff that we have to hope points to hope beyond despair, to love beyond hatred, to peace beyond hostility, to freedom, beyond oppression, and to justice beyond discrimination. Of course, the road to bringing these things to fruition is not easy. It involves great sacrifice and great magnanimity. It is known as the Via della Rosa. And in first century Jerusalem, where all that mix came together, it led to the sacrifice of the cross itself. From Palm Sunday in Jerusalem, we traveled the next day to Hebron. I don't have time to describe for you how heartbreaking and how tense it is to walk through the center of this place. Hebron is a small town the size of Dundee in Scotland, if you know that, smaller than Edinburgh. It's on the West Bank, it's a Palestinian town, but it sits on land that is occupied and has been occupied by Israel since the Six-Day War in 1967. However, what makes Hebron such a stark microcosm of the unrest which persists in what we call the Holy Land is that it is the place where Abraham is buried. And so it is holy to both Jew and Arab. But can they share it peacefully? Abraham, of course, is the father of the three great faiths that dominate the world of religions. We Christians, Jews and Muslims, if we are not brothers and sisters, we are certainly cousins. But we are cousins in a deeply divided family. And places like Jerusalem and Hebron are like the wedding reception where the family comes together and all the tensions come to the surface and the day ends in a riot. Hebron is home to some of the most extreme ideological forces of Orthodox Judaism. They are very rare across the world. These ultra-Orthodox have been allowed by Israel to build homes in the very center of this city on land which international law clearly states does not belong to them. These settlers, as they are called, are so ideologically extreme, they believe that their neighbors in the city, 150,000 Arabs, have no right to continue to exist in the land. And of course, the big problem with the, Israel, the Israeli-Palestinian dialogue is that Palestine, the Palestinians are led by Hamas, who still have in their constitution an understanding that Israel has no right to exist beside it. There's the impasse. And in spite of the fact that few Israelis share the theological outlook of the ultra-Orthodox, these people are nonetheless protected by a detachment of soldiers and a militarized ring of steel which has been imposed around the sacred site of the cave of the patriarchs. This is not one of the regular stops in a tour of the Holy Land. It's a tinderbox. 
It's a tinderbox in which every force that assembled in Gethsemane on that first Holy Week has reassembled today. Faithful disciples of all religions, betrayers, soldiers under orders, holy men of every faith, young men ready with sword or machine gun in hand, and those representing the world of non-violent resistance. It is the same extraordinary mix of emotions, of beliefs, and of cultures. It is the same extraordinary mixture of violence and benign resistance. And it was there in Hebron that I bought the communion cup and the plate that I showed the children and that we will use this morning. I bought them from an Arab trader. And for me, they are used on this communion table to point to hope beyond despair, to love beyond hatred, to peace beyond hostility, to freedom beyond oppression, and to justice beyond discrimination, and to a day when the three great cousins can sit down in love and in peace and in grace with one another. It may be a long way off, and it won't come cheap. It will only come at the price of great sacrifice, the sacrifice of taking up our cross and giving our lives to those sacred values of our faith. Amen. slight change to the order of service, we continue our worship now with the uplifting of our offering. Let us pray. Almighty God, we place these gifts on this table as a token of our commitment, a token of our commitment of ourselves and of our energies to the building of your kingdom. And we pray that you would use them and that we would use them rightly in your service. For Jesus' sake. We sing now the first and the last verses only, the first and the last verses 
of hymn 734, O Christ, You Wept. Hear the words of the institution of the Lord's Supper according to St. Paul. The tradition that I handed on to you came to me from the Lord himself, that on the night of his arrest, the Lord Jesus took bread. And after giving thanks to God, he broke it and said, this is my body, which is for you. Do this in memory of me. In the same way, he took the cup after supper and said, this cup is the new covenant sealed by my blood. Whenever you drink it, do this in memory of me. For every time you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the death of the Lord until he comes. God is always trying to speak to us in the common things and in the common experiences of life. In the midst of time, God is always trying to give us glimpses of eternity. So I take these elements of bread and wine to be set apart from all common use, that through them we may enter into our blessed Lord and He into us, that they may tell us of His sacrifice, that they may comfort us with His grace, confirm us in His strength, and fill us with His life. And as Jesus gave thanks and blessed, let us draw near to God and offer Him our prayers and thanksgiving. The Lord be with you. you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. Almighty God, we thank you for this sacrament and for all who through the long years of history have found at this table the light that never fades, the joy that no one can take from them, the forgiveness of their sins, and the presence of their Lord. We thank you for all the means of grace, for the church to be our mother in the faith, for the book that tells us of your ways, for the open door of prayer which is ever set before us. We thank you that you have made us as we are, for the dream that will not die, that somehow we cannot sin in peace, that even in the mud we are haunted by the stars, Therefore, with your people of all places and times, and with the whole company of heaven, we proclaim your greatness and sing your praise in the angel's song. Holy, holy, holy Lord, God of power and might, heaven and earth are full of your glory. Hosanna in the highest. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. Send down your Holy Spirit, to bless us and these your gifts of bread and wine, that the bread which we break may be for us the communion of the body of Christ, 
and the cup of blessing which we bless, the communion of the blood of Christ, that we receiving them by faith may be made partakers of his body and blood with all his benefits to nourish us and help us to grow in grace to the glory of your most holy name. God of faith and love, as members of the Christian family, we pray for the whole church of Jesus Christ. Make her faithful in your service and generous in love. May we, your people, so live in Christ that we may be his body in the world today. And now we give thanks for all who have departed this life. Keep us with them in communion with Christ our risen Lord, and bring us at the last with all your saints to eat and drink in the glory of your eternal kingdom through Jesus Christ our Lord. Our Father, our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever, ever. Amen. Come to this table, not because you must, but because you may. Come, not because you're strong, but because you're weak. Come, not because any goodness of your own gives you the right to come, but because you need mercy and help. Come because you love the Lord a little, and you would like to love Him more. Come because He loved you and gave Himself for you. Lift up your hearts and minds above your cares and fears, and let this bread and wine be to you the token and pledge of the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit, all meant for you, if you will receive them in humble faith. According to the holy institution, example and command of our Lord Jesus Christ, and as a memorial of Him, we do this, who on the night when he was betrayed, took bread. And when he had given thanks for it, he broke it and said, This is my body, which is broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, at the end of the meal, he took the cup and said, This cup is the new covenant sealed by my blood, whenever you drink it, do it in memory of me. Lamb of God, that takest away the sins of the world, have mercy upon us. Lamb of God, that takest away the sin of the world, have mercy upon us. Lamb of God, that takest away the sin of the world, grant us thy peace. Draw near with faith, Receive the body of our Lord Jesus Christ, which was given for you, and his blood, which was shed for you. Feed on him in your hearts by faith. The body of Christ broken for you. 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 blood of Christ which was shed for you. The blood of Christ which was shed for you. The blood of Christ which was shed for you. The blood of Christ which was shed for you. The 
body of Christ, which was given for you, the blood of Christ, which was shed for you. Taste and see that the Lord is good.
peace of the Lord Jesus Christ be with you all. Let us pray. Lord God, we give thanks for a prayer answered, for a problem made clearer, for a hope reawakened, for a faith made stronger, for a grace given, and for the promise of a blessing to take away. When the road ahead is steep, when the challenges ahead are testing, and when we are tempted to give up, to give up on ourselves, on the church, or on you, may we remember this moment when we were caught up in the company of your people and in the fellowship of your Holy Spirit. And may this moment sustain us throughout this week, and may we conduct ourselves as people who have shared with one another the grace of and goodness of your hand. Amen. In closing, we sing the hymn 721, We Lay Our Broken World. And so now that our worship is over, let our service in the world begin. And may the blessing of God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit go with each one of us and remain with each one of us this day, tomorrow, and forevermore.